Ayo, and what is up, gang? Thank you so much for checking out Sledgehammer TV here tonight. It is Monday, February the 12th, 2018, and Monday Night Raw came to us from San Jose, California, and the way this show ended is absolutely unacceptable, and it just makes my head want to explode, and we are going to talk about it right here and right now on the newest, fastest rising podcast in all of YouTube Baby! The Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. So, let's do it. Alright wrestling fans, thank you so much for joining me, my name is Nick Nightmare, along with me as always is my trusty companion, my loyal tag team partner and the world heavyweight champion of microphones, Blue the Snowball, and we are here to talk about tonight's Monday Night Raw. And man, do they piss me off sometimes, in so many different ways, because although I did enjoy... The first maybe hour and 20 minutes or so of this show. And I did very much enjoy tonight's main event. I thought tonight's action in the main event for the Fatal 5-Way was very, very good. Possibly the best Fatal 5-Way I've seen in the string of Fatal 5-Ways that we have had over the course of the last calendar year or so. That being said, the finish tonight... The way this show went off the air is unacceptable. And I don't give a shit if you were pressed for time or if this segment went over, that segment went over. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you went almost to 11.30 on Monday Night Raw. And tonight, you had to be off the air before 10 after? I don't understand why we couldn't get a further explanation, at least go off the air with the general manager making the announcement that he decided to make via social media, thanks to WWE.com exclusive, Raw General Manager wants to come out, Kurt Angle wants to tell everybody that due to the fact that in tonight's main event, we had Bray Wyatt actually eat two pinfalls at the same time, the WWE hates Bray Wyatt so much that they actually had him pinned by two men at once. Kurt Angle wants to come out there and say Seth Rollins and Finn Balor both won the match. So therefore, they will both be added to the Elimination Chamber, making it for the first time ever. What are they doing this just so they can do, you know, and, and, and say that again so they can get their rocks off? First time ever? Seven Man Elimination Chamber. That is bullshit. That is bullshit. Logistically, they're not going to add a fifth pod. So all they're doing is going to kick off the Elimination Chamber with a triple threat. Which means that now three of the contestants will be starting this match as opposed to two. So three men are at a disadvantage. Four men will be locked away in the chambers. And who gives a shit? Really? That is asinine. That is lazy and uncreative booking. There are so many different ways they could have went about this. There are, There is still one more show before the Elimination Chamber at the end of this month. There is the Go Home Show next week. We have two full weeks to go. You can't have Finn Balor versus Seth Rollins next week to decide which man enters the Elimination Chamber. Instead, you're just going to go all in... And throw everybody in the chamber. Just throw everyone in the chamber. Jason Jordan got hurt. We don't know what to do with Seth Rollins. Now just throw him in the chamber. We'll just make him start it off right at the beginning. We'll have a triple threat. And that'll be the end of it. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. It is just so stupid. It really, really is. What should be happening is Finn Balor and The Miz should not be in this match. 
And they should be facing each other one-on-one at the Elimination Chamber so that Finn Balor can win the Intercontinental Championship and go on to WrestleMania and face somebody worth his time. Maybe a Samoa Joe. For the Intercontinental Championship, that would be awesome. On the same card as AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura? Come on. That's money. That's money. You're throwing it away. Just to add them into a chamber that neither one of them is going to win. You're adding Seth Rollins into a mix that he's not going to win. If Braun Strowman's not going to win this thing, you know it's going to be Roman Reigns. Everybody's got all their money in on him. It's a sheer inevitability based off of everything we know going towards WrestleMania. So adding more losers to this match does what? Does what? Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy, their involvement should have ended after their failing to qualify for this match singularly. And that's it. They should be headed on a collision course with each other to end at WrestleMania, and that's it. You want to use these things that you're doing with them as bumps on the road? I guess that's fine. But their addition to this whole thing just makes everything all muddled up. There's too many people vying for a spot in an elimination chamber that nobody has any business being near. The winner of the chamber is getting a shot at the championship. Why is Matt Hardy being given a shot to maybe get a chance to win the championship? Bray Wyatt. Even Finn Balor. Would, uh, maybe, okay, he never got his rematch, so you can, you can throw that in there as a caveat as to why. But what has he done lately? What has he done lately? Braun Strowman had a great segment tonight. We'll get into that later on. But if he's not the winner of this Elimination Chamber, it's essentially bullshit. Braun Strowman should win this match and go on to WrestleMania to fight the Beast Brock Lesnar. I think all of us would much rather prefer that. But I doubt WWE is going to change the course of the ship that they've been sailing for the last four years. Seven-man elimination chamber. Just the thought of it just makes my head want to explode. And then you want to have the balls to go off the air without an explanation, with just the referee standing there telling these two guys that they both won. What kind of a dumbass referee counts two men on top of a pin like that? Doesn't he know the rules? There can only be one winner. There's only one spot left. Why would you make that three count? Why would you not break it up? Wait, there's two guys here. One of you's got to get off. Or else there'll be no clear winner. You're an official. Isn't that your job to make sure... You know what? That being said... This, my friends, is the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show right here on Sledgehammer TV. Thank you so much once again for joining us. Don't forget to become part of the family here and join the Sledgehammer Club today. All you have to do, one of the best ways you can show the world that you are awesome, just like I am, is to hit that subscribe button right now. Come along for the ride. Join the family. We have got so much wrestling content on this channel. It is ridiculous with tons and tons more to go. We are expanding into the world of movies and entertainment. We got some new movie reviews going up there. The Cloverfield Project, Paradox rather, absolutely did what Monday Night Raw did to me tonight. And it just blew my mind in a a bad way. And I found the one secret that no one else is talking about that will blow your mind too. So if you're a big fan of sci-fi films and you like the Cloverfield Paradox, go check out what I had to say. If you're not into movies or anything else and you're just a pro wrestling fan... Stick here for that as well, because we bring the hammer down on the world of professional wrestling, just like we are going to do here tonight. So don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, share it with all your wrestling buddies and anybody that you know that enjoys some good wrestling discussion and some great wrestling content coming at you each and every week right here from Sledgehammer TV. Thank you guys. If you could do that, I would much appreciate it. And now let's get on with... The review of this show. Like I said, for the first hour or so, I was alright. Not that this was a great show, but I was alright. The show kicked off with John Cena. And his promo was only interesting when he mentioned the fact that at WrestleMania, legends can come back from the dead. And being that we are all assuming his path to WrestleMania is going to end 
with the final match of the dead man, The Undertaker, was an interesting little quote to hear him say during his promo. Nonetheless, this would not be about The Undertaker, nor would it really be about WrestleMania. This whole segment would be about the Elimination Chamber, as The Miz would come out and interrupt John Cena doing his regular John Cena rah-rah thing. And eventually, this would lead to the opening match of the night, which was a WrestleMania 27 rematch. John Cena versus The Miz, and normally I would just totally shit all over this match, but they did want to add the fact that if you lose this match, you will enter first in the Elimination Chamber. Which, like we covered at the beginning, now that there's three, you know, who who cares? You know what I mean? Like, it's, if it's you start the match one-on-one, it's a little more dramatic. But now there's three guys at the start of the match, what does it matter if you're in there first? Because even if you went to the chamber third, you're at a disadvantage right off the bat. I don't know. Let's not get too bogged down in the semantics of that terrible, terrible announcement that is ruining anything going forward towards the Raw main event at WrestleMania and the Elimination Chamber, consequently. But this match between The Miz and Cena was alright. It kicked off... The Miz was trying a little trickery, very, very smart of The Miz, trying to show the world why he believes he's one of the smartest guys in pro wrestling. And this was a very Ric Flair kind of move, if you ask me, as he had his minions beat down John Cena before accepting his challenge for this match and taking the stipulation into account. And then he was trying to get a referee out there, and then Kurt Angle would come out and be like, whoa, that's not how this is going to happen. I love the match. We're going to have it. Let's get a referee out here. And then the match would begin. And this match ended up being very good. I I enjoyed this match. I thought this was a good match for these two guys. It definitely got the crowd amped up. It was a good way to start the show. And I actually thought John Cena was going to (laughs) lose. You know, how stupid am I? How dumb am I? I should be smacked in the back of the head. Just for thinking it. I wish my mom was still here so she could be behind me and give me one of the old Italian right back in the side of her head. Because what's the matter with you for even thinking the possibility that John Cena will put over The Miz and make himself be the first entrant into the Elimination Chamber? How dare you think such of a stupid thing, you dumbass? But I definitely got pie on my face because... The Golden Shovel came out, as usual, and John Cena laid the Miz out, and John Cena, God forbid, God forbid, he had to be the one to overcome all the obstacles and start from number one, and not have the Miz be the heel in the pod, antagonizing, coming in maybe second to last, or coming in fourth. We all know Elias is going to be the last man in. So... You know, essentially, it really didn't matter. But it was an entertaining segment. I didn't care too much uh, in a negative way. You know, it didn't bring me down. I was like, all right, this is a good start to the show, so let's let's keep things rolling. And they did. They gave us a very decent tag team matchup for the Revival versus the club. The only negative here being is the continual burial of Gallows and Anderson. Now... Consequently, you'd say, well, Nick, if if the Revival won, you'd be saying the same thing. And that's the only reason why I don't really like this match. These teams, neither one of them have been built up to a point where either one of them are being seen as formidable. Both teams deserve to be built up in that light. But Gallows and Anderson are pretty much a joke. As shown by their promo with all the pop-up fucking words that I can't stand. The Nerdometer, I didn't mind. I just think... Maybe you should have made it make more sense. Maybe have the crowd interaction gauge where the movement of the needle goes. You know, be a little bit more interactive with the fans. You want to see what the fans have to see. You know, whatever. But the words popping in my face during Monday Night Raw and during SmackDown Live, it is unacceptable. You want to do it during a 20-minute mixed match challenge show where it was probably well received because it's an internet based show, an interactive based show, it's alright. Like I said, I don't mind it there. But on these shows, there's no call for the graphic enhancements. I don't even like the layout anymore. I don't like all the white. All the white in the background and in the logos and all the arrows. I don't like it. I feel like I'm always watching YouTube now 
when I'm watching Monday Night Raw, even when I'm watching it on my 60 plus inch TV in my living room, on my cable provider, not on my internet, not on my computer or anything else, but that's what it feels like. I feel like I'm constantly on YouTube with this new packaging of Monday Night Raw, and I'm not really too much into it. But the Revival versus the Club was a pretty decent tag team match. The Revival told a good story. They attacked Luke Gallo's knee right at the onset of this match before the match even began, trying to gain the early advantage, and it would prove to be the determining factor in this match as they incapacitated him to the outside. Carl Anderson ate a shadow machine on the inside after being pretty impressive on the inside of the ropes himself. It's not often you get to see Carl Anderson do anything. So... To see him actually perform tonight and perform very well, because he's in there with two very skilled wrestlers to play with, it was good to see, although it ended up with his shoulders being pinned to the mat. One, two, three, the Revival gets the win. Not a bad tag team match. Although, again, the booking of it, nonsensical, burial of the Revival in the process, I'm sorry, burial of the, the club in the process of raising the Revival but, you know, cookie cookie crumbs and baby steps may be in the right direction for the Revival. We'll see. They'll probably end up just losing out of nowhere next week with the way the WWE's been writing shit lately. Sasha Banks versus Bailey in an essential grudge match based off of personal comments that have been going on through social media and based off of last week where Bailey pretty much came right out and told Sasha Banks that she could beat her. We were in Bailey's hometown, like I said, in uh, San Jose, California. And automatically, you assume Bailey's going to lose. Not only because she's going up against the boss, who has the momentum right now on the Monday Night Raw women's division, but because she's in her hometown. And statistics show that when you go to your hometown, you lose. But that did not happen here tonight. And after a very, very good match, because Sasha and Bailey are great opponents, so obviously they're going to have a good match. I've been begging for this match on a bigger scale. Having this match right now, I will forgive it because it is seemingly the new launch point to get to where we want to be with Sasha Banks. As you can tell just in her facial reactions at the end of this match when she lost... She did not look like she was going to go give Bailey that hug that Bailey looked like she wanted so badly to make sure that there were no hard feelings. She was pissed off. And we don't know what was going to happen because Nia Jax would come out and just lay them both to waste. We're going to get back to Nia Jax in just a second. But Sasha versus Bailey happening here tonight. I I feel like this should have happened a long, long time ago. As many of you guys probably feel the same way. But it's it's kind of lost right now in this woman's revolution. This is the feud that should have launched the woman's revolution. And it's now just like, just another course on this big meal of woman's stuff that they've been just throwing at our face. So to me, it's getting kind of lost in the shuffle. But this was a very good match Bailey wins, surprisingly, like I said, setting things kind of in motion. This should have been a pay-per-view match, many of you guys would say, but I say no. I say there's many matches in this story, and this is a good way to kick it off. Sasha Banks, although she lasted 50-plus minutes in the Royal Rumble, has not been on that good of a run as of late. She's lost to Asuka. Now she's lost to Bailey. She lost the Royal Rumble despite her impressive performance. She's spiraling down. So the legit boss, the real legit boss, is going to come. And uh, I couldn't say it could come any sooner. Nia Jax attacking after this match. They're doing this to make her look like a formidable opponent for Asuka. That's obvious. And just like I said about Sasha and Bailey's feud, if they would have taken this exact scenario with Nia Jax and pulled this off upon her arrival, giving her aspirations to be the woman's champion, no matter who it was at the time of her coming up to the main roster, Nia Jax would be a big star. Right now, 
doing it now only to build her up and build her up and make her look so awesome just to lose to Asuka is one of the formulas WWE has been using that has been killing this product. They've done it to Rusev. They've done it to Strowman. They've done it to everybody. They even did it to Brock Lesnar. You gave him the Undertaker streak. You build him up as this undefeatable, untamable beast. And then you have him beaten by a 50-year-old semi-retired Bill Goldberg. Just to give that guy the rub. You sacrifice everybody's momentum constantly. It's a very, very big problem. And it's one of the things that hindered Nia Jax. So, aside from the fact that she was maybe having a bad head day and didn't look too good, this whole segment didn't look good to me. And then you want to come back and highlight whatever it is she had to say at the end of the match, which was clearly scripted and ridiculous. And then you want to have them pop-up words coming again in a replay. Like, during the commercial break, you were like, let's throw the words up in whatever it is she just said. Or if you already had it ready, how much more clearer can you show the viewing audience, oh yeah, this is scripted because we already have the viewing stuff. You know, we already know what she's going to say, so we have the words ready for the screen. Terrible. Terrible, terrible. Kurt Angle comes out. He wants to get down on the fans... Because the fans openly cheered Jason Jordan not being able to compete at WrestleMania. I thought this was interesting. I don't think it was written for him to go this way. I think he genuinely reacted to the fan in San Jose. And props to them for voicing their opinion. But damn, you guys are cold out there in San Jose. He pretty much told everybody, Jason Jordan's hurt. He's not going to be... Able to compete at WrestleMania, the crowd went berserk, started chanting yes, being all happy about it. And Kurt was like, hey, listen, you know, if if you're happy about somebody being injured and not being able to perform at WrestleMania, then you're a shit person. That's essentially what he said. You're a piece of shit. And you shouldn't feel that way. We would then have Seth Rollins come out and steer the ship back in the right direction. Which was the fact that he wants it to be Monday Night Rollins again. Monday Night Rollins. When was it ever Monday Night Rollins? Seriously. I pick up what he's putting down in this uh, in this scenario here. But this is where things start to get fucked up. Because he wants to not just be a part of Monday Night Raw. He wants to be Monday Night Raw. So he needs to be in serious competition. He needs a match. At the Elimination Chamber. Kurt Angle says, hey, you know, maybe we'll get you another tag team partner. And Seth's like, thanks, but no thanks, buddy. I want to do things on my own. I want to burn this place down to the ground. Kurt Angle sticks him into the Fatal 4-Way, making it a Fatal 5-Way in the main event for tonight's show. I didn't mind it. I definitely did not expect it to have such serious ramifications. As per his involvement, which we will discuss again when we get to the end of this review. I started to fall off with this show when we had the women's tag team match. Which is a shame, because it has my girl Alexa Bliss in there. Before they had this match, they had Alexa and Mickey trying to explain the very weird scenario that happened last week. Where Alexa Bliss came out and saved Mickey James from Absolution. It was so weird and so vexing that I forgot to even mention it when we were talking about Monday Night Raw last week. And they were going to go up against Absolution here, I guess based off of what happened last week. Absolution needs a new theme song. I know Paige was out there with them, but giving them just Paige's song is just... It just puts the whole thing off for me. I just don't care about it. I never really did... You know, I I dubbed them Crap Solution for a reason. But the fact of the matter is, all I was hoping that would happen during this match is that Mandy Rose would flip out and leave Crap Solution in their dust, in their gold dust, to be precise, and uh, go and do the rose gold thing full-time, as that would be way 
more entertaining. It would be a better use of her time. It would be a better way to see her on TV. And she could learn infinitely more from a guy like Dustin Runnels than she could from Paige and Sonya Deville. That's for sure. This match was nothing. Crap Solution wins. Then they attack Mickey James post-match. Alexa Bliss comes in for the save once again. I don't know what Alexa's intentions are. You have five other women in that elimination chamber gunning after you and your championship. What is having Mickey James on your side going to make a difference? I don't get it. We'll see where it leads. Elias, my man. Who wants to walk with Elias? We definitely do. WWE, walk with Elias. I love the whole shtick. And I actually enjoyed this segment very much. But I didn't at the same time. And there's a couple of reasons for that. They're not tremendous reasons. And we're not going to go too far off on it. But I need to bring these things to your attention. Because if I hear somebody call a cello... A giant guitar. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm a musician. Okay. I don't know every instrument in the world. But I clearly know a fucking cello when I see one. You don't have to be knowledgeable in the classic arts of music. It's one of the basic things you learn. Just even from watching Channel 13. Watching Sesame Street. Watching... Anything growing up educational, whether you watch The Electric Company, 3 to one Contact, like I said, Sesame Street, you learned what that was. Do you not know what a violin is? You don't have to know everything about music. You know when you see a violin that it's called a violin. It's not a mini guitar. A cello is not a giant guitar. You fucking idiots. It just was making me so infuriated. Maybe that makes me... An idiot. Maybe I'm I'm nitpicking in your opinion. But god damn it's basic education. Michael Cole sounded like an idiot. Braun Strowman has a giant guitar. No he doesn't. He's holding a giant cello. 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 It's not even a guitar. It's a bass. That being said, my only other complaint with this whole thing is the fact that it, at the end of the whole segment, it made Elias look pretty dumb, right? He got beaten by this cello. He got the cello smashed over his back on the entrance ramp, leaving him in a pile of dust. Didn't make him look too great. Although it is Braun Strowman, so what did you expect would happen, right? I actually think the WWE should have went in the opposite direction. Especially since there were weapons involved. I think maybe they should have gave the upper hand to Elias in this scenario. Let him get one up on the monster. Let him beat him up with the cello. Put him over a little bit. Elias isn't winning the Elimination Chamber. Why not let him get a little exposure here? Braun Strowman ain't gonna have any damage by getting beat down by Elias with a, with a cello. With weapons involved. And then it adds a little extra oomph to when they get into the Elimination Chamber together. You think that Braun Strowman's going to rip Elias apart when he gets his hands on him for what he just did to him on Monday Night Raw. No, but instead, you get babyface Braun coming out, singing, trying to play this thing, ends up busting the cello before he even gets a chance to swing it. He has it just in his lap. He's trying to play it and busts it into pieces. The man is an animal and probably has... Beast-like strength. He busted a cello with little to no effort. And I don't think I will ever again say the word cello so many times in one episode of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. But that's up to the WWE, I guess. Because I didn't ever think I'd be talking about orchestra instruments on this channel for any reason. I knew once in a while we'd be talking about guitars. But I never expected this. All that being said, it was entertaining. It reminded me a little bit of the Attitude Era type stuff. Braun's song was very entertaining. Elias' song was very entertaining. I just thought, why sacrifice Elias here? Why not keep them on an even playing field? 
You just made him look like a schmuck at the end of the day. But that's just my opinion, isn't it? Roman Reigns versus Sheamus. This was an absolutely pointless match. I don't understand why the WWE found it necessary to even book this match. They could have definitely done without this match altogether and added this time to the Fatal 5-Way at the end of the night. It was good enough that, can you imagine if they added another 10 minutes to it? How much more dramatic it would have been towards the end? It would have been fantastic. Roman vs. Sheamus was kind of boring to me until we got towards the end of the match. You know, give me this very same match three years ago. That This is a star-making performance. Because it was a good match, but who cares? Roman's going to lose to Sheamus on the road to WrestleMania? No. They're going to continue to build Roman's momentum. Sheamus is one half of the World Tag Team Champions. If he loses to Roman in a singles capacity, what damage does it do? He's already nothing in a singles capacity. Without Cesaro, Sheamus would be nothing right now. It's a shame. I was very big on Sheamus when he first came up. But what is Sheamus in the last two years without without Cesaro? He's nothing to me. I bet he'd be nothing to you as well. He got over big with this tag team. And now his job is to lose to whatever member of the Shield he's fighting against every week. Because that's what we keep seeing. But the very end was alright. Roman hits the spear out of midair for the win. Who cares? Hall of Fame induction announcement. 2018 Hall of Fame inductee Ivory has been announced tonight. And I'm completely okay with that. Three times woman champion. A former and I believe only woman in WWE history to actively compete in GLOW and in the WWE, which is just fantastic. She definitely deserves it. I'm all right with Ivory going in. I do, however, think that, especially since they shown in the Ivory's package that China was her greatest rival, that maybe China should have gone first, but we know it's a touchy subject and a touchy situation. We're not going to delve too much into it. Ivory deserves it. Just like Victoria deserves it. I thought maybe she would have been the one for this year. But I'm I'm not downing Ivory's announcement. Fantastic. I look forward to seeing her speech at the Hall of Fame. Should be pretty entertaining. She's usually good for a, a good entertaining segment. Then we had the main event. The Fatal Five Way. Absolutely jam-packed with action. It was great. Apollo Crews was so good in this match that for certain moments during watching this match, I thought they'd actually give him the win. Especially with it being Black History Month, I thought, hey, what a great way to to get him over. You could use that as the focus of it and, and do that. But then everybody would probably just be down on it because, oh, they only gave it to him because of that. Some stupid people would probably say some stupid shit about that. But it would be a great... Highlight, I thought. Be a great way to package whatever it is that they're doing with Black History Month with an actual black athlete with fantastic talent and just needs a little bit more charisma to truly get over and and put him over. Maybe put him in this Elimination Chamber match. He's not going to win anyway. What difference does it make if it's Seth Rollins, Finn Balor, or Apollo Crews? Rollins ain't winning Balor ain't winning, so you could effectively have put Apollo Crews in that very same position and changed absolutely nothing about the match, but given it something a little special during a month that is special to Apollo Crews and should be special to everybody who has respect for the black community. I thought that would be fantastic, but it definitely did not go that way. It did not go that way. Not that I want Titus Worldwide to get any bigger. Because we all know how I feel about Titus Worldwide. I really don't care for the whole team. But Apollo Crews, shining performance tonight. Absolutely fantastic. He hung in there with four of the top guys in the WWE and didn't look out of place. So that's got to account for something, doesn't it? Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy did their Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy thing. 
that they always do. A couple of entertaining spots in this match. Matt Hardy at one point actually applauding Bray Wyatt. Just more mind games going on between the two of them. But like I said, the story of this match would come with the pinfall at the end, where Bray Wyatt would end up being pinned by both Seth Rollins and Finn Balor, and the referee counted the three for both of them, and then we went off the air. Great job. Great job. Are you trying to generate suspense? Trying to make us want to tune in next week? No, that's not what you're doing. They ran out of time. Because if they wanted to generate suspense and make us wait, they would have made us wait. They wouldn't have made the announcement five minutes after Raw went off the air. Seven man elimination chamber. Not my cup of tea. We'll see how all that shit plays out as we are on the road to the Elimination Chamber, which is the l not the last stop. It should be the last stop, but the second to last stop. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been fighting to keep that in this whole show, and now you know it didn't happen. The second to last stop on the road to WrestleMania. I just threw that out there in case you noticed maybe my breathing's a little weird today. It's because I still got this little tickle that likes to rear its ugly head here and there, so I apologize for that if it bothered any of you. But that was the Monday Night Raw review. The notes go to the side right now. Tomorrow night is SmackDown Live, and we have the most ridiculous match I've ever heard. We talked about it over the weekend. Dolph Ziggler going one-on-one -on -one with Baron Corbin, and the winner gets entry into what will now be a fatal four-way at Fastlane. And don't, don't be surprised. Do not be surprised if tomorrow night on SmackDown Live we see the exact same thing that happened tonight, only in a different way. I don't know if it'll be a double countout, double disqualification of some kind, but somehow or some way, Baron Corbin will be inserted in this match. Dolph Ziggler will be inserted into this match and that too will end up being a fatal five-way at Fastlane. As it was previously reported that it would be. And I'm absolutely against that as well. But we will have to tune in tomorrow night to see and you are going to have to tune right back in here to Sledgehammer TV to see what I thought about the whole thing. Hopefully... This week's edition of SmackDown Live does not lull me to sleep like a sweet lullaby like it did last week, causing me to have to wait almost a full 24 hours to get the SmackDown Live review up there for you guys. Thank you once again for joining me. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you have not done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Nick Nightmare. Check us out on Facebook at The Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. The fan page is there for you to join Two great ways to follow us and keep tabs on this channel and everything that we do here. But the best way, like I said, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. My name is Nick Nightmare. This has been Blue the Snowball Microphone, the world heavyweight champion of microphones. And this has been the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show right here on Sledgehammer TV only on youtube.com that is going to do it and we are out of here and we will see you next time right here here on the sledgehammer wrestling show see you guys tomorrow night for smackdown live dig it <laughs>